Do we have Zoom up and going? Do we have folks on Zoom today? Zach. Zach. Just Zach. Okay. But oh, we're missing a couple others. All right. Well, oh, I did forget the mic. Do what? Is the mic didn't? So I actually clicked on the. I think I forgot it last time. Was it okay last time? I assume here it was okay. Mm -hmm. Zach, can you hear me okay? Should I put on the mic? Uh, he said I can hear you just fine. Okay. We'll just leave it like that. It's kind of a pain to walk around with the mic if I don't need it. Okay. Hope you're doing well, Zach. I guess maybe I should ask Zach a question today. I, I realized I think I got almost everybody yesterday, but I didn't get Zach. Maybe you feel left out. I like stare at the camera, which, you know, we'll get you. Okay. So today we're doing vectors and tensors along the way today. Feels a little bit out of order to me. I kind of feel like we should have done this one first, but then again, we got to jump into transport. So maybe you can think of it like we got to do some stuff. Now we're going to back up and really realize why we need it. There's some pedagogical use in that too. Um, so we're going to start out talk about what is a vector. Um, I would assume, and I, this lecture, there's probably there's too much in it. Okay. But I'm going to breeze through some stuff because I think you know a lot of the some of the stuff, and I want you to help me slow down in parts where you're confused. Okay, where it's new. So I'm going to start out, and I'm going to be a little rigorous with vectors and vector spaces, okay, and a little abstract. Because we're graduate students, and like it's time, okay, to be rigorous. It's a little fun to be mathematical, okay. Um, but then we're going to go through some kind of boring things like properties, all right. And I'm just going to kind of rattle those off. And if we know it and this makes sense, we're just going to move on. And then as we get into here, we're going to talk a little bit about notation and some of these products. And there may be some products that are new and some manipulation with tensors that's that's unfamiliar that maybe you haven't practiced with, okay? And I want to try and highlight some of the tricks I use when I do this every day so that maybe you can get better at it and see how to sort of formally do these manipulations. And by form, I, formally, I don't mean stiff and like a tie. I mean the form of right, how, to, how to do some of these things practically and easily, okay? Um, and then we'll see how far we get into vector calculus. Um, and next time we'll do more vectors and tensors, but we're going to try and do different coordinate systems. So we're going to try and get through as much of this today as possible. Okay, so that's kind of an overview we're going to be. So the first thing is, what is a vector? So um, this may sound kind of tautological, but we will go with it anyway. So a vector is an object in a vector space. Okay, so that's on it kind of sounds like not that useful, but let's hopefully make that um, be a little useful. So a vector space is a mathematical construction. Okay, it's a set. Um, and this set obeys certain axioms. Those axioms are things like being closed under vector addition. Okay, so maybe we'll write this down just that a vector space. is an abstract mathematical object set that obeys certain axioms. Okay. And I'm not going to go through the list of axioms. It depends on where you look and what math book. Sometimes there's like five or six, sometimes there's eight, okay? But basically, it's pretty normal things. It's things like if I have this object and I add some, you know, an object in the vector space, okay? And I add another object in the vector space, it stays in the vector space, okay? So that means it's close under addition, or there is an identity that if I add something, it comes up, you know, it's the same thing. That's like zero vector, okay? If I multiply by it, it's one. It's the identity, vector, things like this, okay? And so um, there's this definition of these axioms, okay, that defines a vector space. And then there are many examples then of, of spaces that are vector spaces. So this starts to get a little more concrete. So some examples would be, uh, what do I, what's the word I used for this? N tuples of real numbers. Okay, so this would be like, oh, that was the worst that 
the set of all real numbers, the set of all pairs of real numbers, the set of all triples of real numbers, right? Okay, so these are the ones that you're normally thinking about when you think about a vector, right? You're thinking about like R3, three-dimensional vector, okay? There are others, so for instance, all n by m matrices, okay, are a vector space. Um, there is also, um, let's see, what, what did I call it? It's, I want to make sure I give it the right. Continuous real functions on some domain data B is also a vector space. I don't know if we'll get to talk about that a lot more, but there are infinite dimensional vector spaces. Okay, these are really useful when you're talking about solutions to PDEs. Okay, if you took a PDEs class, maybe you've seen that before. Uh, if you talk about things like uh, orthogonal uh, functions. Have you ever heard that word for to, to describe a function? Okay, because you can think about functions as being a member of a vector space. Okay, and maybe this maybe takes you back to linear algebra a little bit. But okay, so we have these examples of vector spaces. So then a vector is going to be an object that lives in these spaces. So for example, um, if I have R2. Okay, um, I can have some vector that lives in R2. Okay, we'll call that vector V. And what defines the vector are two things. It needs to have a basis, okay, and then a set of coordinates. Okay, so we might define a basis here as, we'll call this delta 1 and delta 2, okay, and then our vector v is going to be some coordinates, let's say 2, 3, which will give us 2 of delta 1 plus 3 of delta 2, okay. So let's, let's be a little clear about this. So a basis is any set of vectors or, or any set of, uh, yeah, we'll see that, Basis is a set of, and then it has to be linearly independent, okay, uh, vectors that, okay, another thing is they need to span the space, the vector space, okay? So you can see this if you recall this idea from linear algebra, right? Delta 1 and delta 2, they are linearly independent, right? I can uh, add them up and, you know, the, if I had linearly dependent, I would have like delta 1 and delta 2 would be in the same direction, right? So then I couldn't add them up. And then they need to span the whole space, which means I need to be able to, to cover, right, all of R2 by taking combinations of delta one and delta two, okay? So you need a basis. Once you have a basis, you can define a set of coordinates, and then those coordinates are relative to that basis, and that describes the vector, okay? So maybe this example looks trivial, okay? But we can define different basis vectors if we want. We don't, this basis here, delta one, delta two, this is called the natural basis for R2, okay? Natural basis for I think reasons that seem hopefully pretty clear, okay? But I could alternatively define um, something like this. I could define delta one prime and delta two prime, okay? And now I could rewrite a set of coordinates to describe that vector. That vector would still be the same vector, right? Still has the same physical meaning, but now I've changed the basis and now I change the coordinates, okay? So it's important to realize that. So in our, in our class, okay, these coord these, this basis, this is gonna be maybe in a confusing name, this is gonna be our coordinate system, okay? So we can have a Cartesian coordinate system or a spherical coordinate system or whatever, right? But we're gonna use that to define basis vectors, okay? And then we're going to have a set of coordinates, 
okay, that will tell us what that vector is in that coordinate system. So if I have something, some vector v, I could write it in Cartesian coordinates, right? Or I could alternatively rewrite that in spherical coordinates. It's the same vector, but in a different basis, it has a different set of coordinates in front. Does that make sense? Okay, so let's see, I've covered that, covered that. I think that's all of A. This was A. So that was to me the first, the most abstract part of the discussion. Are there questions about that? Hopefully we see why that's useful. There's other reasons why it's useful to know that. But. Okay, so B is scalars, vectors. So, like I said, in this class, we're mostly going to stick to R2 and R3. We might do, we might talk about this a little bit more when we get to PDEs. When we talk about things like separation of variables. Um, so we are going to, okay, we call something uh, a scalar, okay, if it is in just a set of real numbers. Okay. We're going to call that a scalar. We call it a scalar because it scales vectors, right? So if I multiply that number by a vector, okay, uh, it scales it. Okay, we will call something in R2 or R3 uh, vector, okay? So now there's, we sort of have to distinguish between the idea of the abstract notion of a vector. So in some sense, right, everything here, I said a vector was anything that's an object in a vector space. But in our sort of colloquial engineering language, when we, mean, when we say vector, we really mean some object in R2 or R3, right? We don't normally call a continuous real function on A and B a vector, even though in an abstract sense it is, okay? And then we're going to call something, okay, or in this note, we might probably learn this in like physics class in high school. This has a magnitude and a direction, right? So, you know, this is, an, this is a, uh, the coordinates that we define. We can also write as a magnitude and a direction, okay? And now we're going to say a direct or dyadic product of two vectors, we're going to call that a tensor. Okay, so what do I mean by a direct or dyadic product? So what I mean is I can write down delta 1, delta 2. Okay, so this is like a, a map of these two unit vectors, but I'm putting them together and projecting it out to two, you know, sort of a two dimensional space beyond this, right? So now I have objects that have two directions, okay? Sometimes this is also written delta one with a cross with a circle around it, delta two, okay? They're equivalent notations, okay? Some people prefer this. So sometimes see that as a tensor product, okay? So tensor product, dyadic product, okay, same thing like this, all right? So what you can do with this is you can take two vectors, say u of v, okay? And now that defines a matrix where previously u1, you know, u was u1, u2, u3, and v is also v1, v2, v3, now I can write this as u1, v1, u, oh no, u's and v's always get me. u1, v2, u1, v3, u2, v1, u2, v2, u2, v3, 3v1, u3, v2. Okay, so 
the dyadic product here takes all of the elements of U and all of the elements of V, multiplies them all by each other. You can kind of think of it like a parentheses, you know, sum. Okay, when you do that. So another way to think about that is I can say that U V is equal to the sum over I, the sum, yeah, sum over J of U I V J delta I delta J. With those are the unit vectors. Okay? So this these two guys together make a unit dyad. Right? So maybe to I mean, maybe I'll pause there for a second and see if you have any questions. Does this make sense? Hopefully you've seen this enough before. Okay, so what does this unit dyad is also an object in a vector space. Okay, so this I can form a basis with you know one zero 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 zero. Okay, that might be uh, that's delta one, delta one. Okay, when I could have delta one, delta two, delta one, delta three, I have nine of them. Okay, and I could use that as my basis for a vector space of v. Okay, so a tensor is also, in a sense, an abstract vector. Okay, but um, when we talk about scalar vector tensor, we mean this idea here. Okay, but there's also this broader idea of a vector space. The other thing I'll say is that we can continue on with this. We can define, we call this a rank two tensor because it has a magnitude in two directions. Okay, so we could say that about this. It has a magnitude in two directions. So that means it's rank two tensor. Okay. But there's nothing stopping us from defining a rank three tensor, which has a direct product of three of these vector unit vectors, right? So delta one, delta two, delta one or something, okay? We can define a rank four tensor, rank five tensor and on up, okay? The most I've ever seen practically is a rank four tensor. We actually saw it earlier in the class, if you remember, when we were looking at the uh, Newton's uh, law of viscosity. And I said, you know, we needed to understand in general, we had tau and we had another velocity gradient on the velocity and there was something, okay, that needed to go there for the viscosity. And I said, in general, it could be a four quarter tensor, okay, or rank four tensor, right? So um, we've seen that object. That's pretty much the most I've ever seen. I don't know if you guys find six order tensors, let me know. That sounds fun. Terrible. Okay. Questions about this so far? All right. So we're spending a little time on this sort of abstract sort of guts of it. All right. And I think this is pretty much the end of that. And we're going to now talk about manipulation. Okay. And hopefully this will relate to what you're going to do. Practice for your homework. And make you guys masters of tensors. Doing all right, Zach? Yep. Well, we even get we even get sound. That's awesome. I didn't know we would get this sound. Did you have to get a test, Zach? Yeah, I did. Did you test negative or positive? If I can ask. So I went with. Two, well, I went the same day as two other people who I know, um, and they both got their results back, but I have not yet. So, You're waiting. Yep. Well, wish you the best. Thanks. Yeah, two of my roommates have it, so. Uh oh, bummer. Okay. So, really quickly, we're going to do notation. This is actually, I think, one of the most important things I want you to get out of this lecture. So, okay, there's two primary sets of notation for vectors. Okay, there are two sets. 
The first is Gibbs notation. Okay, Gibbs notation will look really familiar to you. It says things like V or V with the arrow over it. Okay, I just put the line underneath because that's how I learned it and because uh, it's easier on the board and things like this. Okay, but we might have A or, you know, in a book, they'll just have like a bold A, right? Um, or gradient, okay? So I'm sure you've seen this in your math class, okay? Gibbs notation. The other one we're going to talk about is Einstein notation or index notation, okay? And I've been using this sort of a little bit, but we're going to be a little more careful about it. Okay, so here we use a single subscript to denote the vector. Okay, and you can think about this as an index over the, the coordinates, okay, as we're writing them. So here we'd have vi, ai, j, or in this case, the gradient, we're going to have, oh, I'll that v. Some students get those confused, right? There's, there's this D, right, a regular D. There's a delta, a small delta, and then the curly D for a partial derivative is like a separate D, like a separate typographical character. Anyway, so you can't get these two confused. Some students, they think this is the same as that, even though, you know, whatever, but it matters, especially for this class, because Bird uses deltas as his unit vectors. Okay. And if you get deltas confused with your partials, you're in trouble. Okay, so don't do that in this class. Okay, um, so index notation is sort of a sim is a simplified way of writing the following. So if I have the velocity vector like this, I can write this as a sum over the coordinates vi multiplied by the unit vector delta i. Right, that's what that means. If I write that out without the sum sign. That's going to be like V1 delta 1 plus V2 delta 2 plus V3 delta 3. Or delta 1, delta 2, delta 3 could be X, Y, Z or whatever, right? So it's convenient though because it's often uh, redundant information or not important information to one, drop the sum sign, okay? And we'll see that there'll be rules for that. That's easy. And the other is we don't need to write the unit vector all the time. We can just write vi, okay? And it turns out that Einstein notation is really useful for doing proofs, okay? For putting things in computers. And was there anything else? Uh, I think that's basically it. But both of those are really valuable, okay? So one, if you're anything like me, you'll find that you do a lot of things on computers, okay? You're probably not that much like me, but Andrew has to do CFD, so maybe he'll appreciate this, okay? But you probably do a lot more math on a computer than you do by hand anyway, okay? So being able to write things down like this are sort of easy to think about, how do I put this into uh, an array or other things, right? So that's easy. Um, but the one that's really valuable for our class is it makes proofs almost trivial, okay? So there are lots of vector identities that you have to write down, they have to be able to do. And if you use Gibbs notation, okay, and you don't think about index notation, and you don't learn these couple of rules, you're going to be flipping to that part of your book a lot. You wear out that appendix, okay? But if you learn how to do index notation right, you almost never need to look up any proofs. You can just, or those identities, you can just do it on the fly, okay? One or two steps, never have to memorize an identity again, okay? So that's the promise of using Einstein notation. Okay, one more thing about notation to say is um, it's also really useful to write our coordinates in, as uh, column or row vectors or matrices. That's often really useful for doing manipulation. So you can write V or VI, you can write this as a column matrix, kind of like one, two, three, okay? Um, where this is the delta one, you know, this will go to delta two, this will go to delta. Three, okay. If it's one, two, and three, maybe that's bad. You know, right? one, five, make that an eight, okay? Just whatever numbers those are, okay? I didn't want that to be confusing. You can also write it as a, as a row matrix, or as a, a row vector, excuse me, okay? 
And then something like AIJ, right? You've seen we can write it as a three by three matrix. I don't want to write all the numbers out, okay? But it's really useful to be able to write those out. Okay. Last one. Questions? We're good, Christina? I think you're okay. You're still writing, so maybe I'm interrupting. Okay. All right. Okay. So vector and tensor algebra. Let's do algebra with these guys. So the first thing is properties. And this you can look up a lot in your book. Okay. They've got all these properties. I don't want to spend a lot of time with this. But basically, you can add them. You can subtract them. You can multiply by a scalar. We, we know this, right? Like I assume this is something that's common, that's familiar, right? So I can do, you know, V plus W. If I were to write this out, we could do an example where we take 158 and add it to 264, okay? And we could find another vector, okay? There's properties where this is uh, commutative under addition, right? So it doesn't matter if I write it forwards or backwards. Um, I have things that are associative. So if I have a scalar R and a scalar S multiplied by a vector U, I also get that this is SR times U. Okay, all the normal things that you do with numbers that you're used to. Okay, there's properties like this. So this I said was commutative. This is associative. Okay, so and so on, okay? I'm gonna put C, B, S, L, appendix, A, okay? For more of these properties. I am gonna highlight, um, is there anything I'll highlight there? Not under, okay, so if I call this properties, let's see, this is all addition, subtraction, multiplication of scalar. Okay, so that's all those guys. So then let's talk about product. We can slow down a little bit here. Okay. We already talked about one product. Okay, we did the dyadic product. I said it was also called the tensor, or it's also called the outer product. Okay? And in Einstein notation, we're going to write this one, or in Gibbs notation, we'll do UV. In Einstein notation, we'll do UI VJ. Okay? So note that we get an index for each of the, the vectors here. Okay? So this means, and re remember that in any matrix, whether I do it as a dyadic product or just have a matrix, the first number is the rows, okay? And the second number is the columns of the matrix, okay? So when I go down to write this guy, we've already written this up here. But when I go down to write it, I should go across the rows, right? I should be a constant across the rows. So that means I'm gonna have a U1 on all the top, a U2 on all the second row, and a U3 on the third row. And then VJ is the columns, right? So then I'm going to have a V1 down first column, V2 down the second column, V3 down the third column. Okay, does that make sense? So don't get them backwards. So just remember row column. I don't know another way to, to, I don't know a good mnemonic for that. RC car maybe, I don't know. Something that helps you remember, okay, row column. So we had DC when we were talking about, you know, direction and component, here we have RC, row column, okay? So that's one thing I hope you can get out of this is as we practice this, that you can know how to, be able to just write these kinds of things down without having to look them up and remember which direction they are. I think some of that's just a little bit of practice. 
Okay. Note that this product does not commute. Okay. So U V is not the same thing as V U. You see why that's the case? Uh, let's see. Uh, Brian, does that make sense why that's the case? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Because it's going to switch the rows and columns, right? So we can't say something about UV, actually. We can say that it's equal to the transpose of V. Right? That makes sense. I just said it switches the rows and columns. We switch the order. So that's what's going on here. All right. Um, other products. We've got dot product. The dot product, I leave the first half of the dot product over here. The dot product, um, the key idea here is that um, we're going from something like two vectors, vectors to a scalar. Okay, or we can do a vector and a tensor. Okay, and that's going to go to a vector. Okay, or we can go from a tensor and a tensor and get back a tensor. So we do a dot product. All right, and so your book, I think they have this nice little table where they show what these products are. But if you think a vector here, we've got one and one dimension, right? And we go to zero dimensions. So the dot product removes sort of two dimensions from the, from the product, okay? So when I have a vector and a tensor, I have one and two, then I go back to one, right? So the dot product, like, I lose two dimensions. Okay. So you should be able to see that come out. So when we're writing this now as a, um, this dot product also, by the way, is sometimes called an inner product. Okay. And now if I write something like V dot W in Gibbs notation, this is going to equal V I W I and in index notation. All right. So if I, if I wrote that all out, you know, as you probably have seen before in a dot product, I can write it out as a sum of these, uh, uh, I'll just write that sum up. It's easier to just write it. I, I can write VI, let's see, WI, uh, well, let's say, right? Okay, because the unit vectors uh, cancel with each other, okay? And so in index notation, I just drop the sum. So this is one of the rules of index notation is a repeated index has a sum. Okay, that's a rule of index notation. So if I have an index all on its own, that's a vector. Okay, so when I had, you know, something just like this, ui, that's a vector. But if I repeat the index, that implies a sum over that index. Okay, so then you'll have to write the sum sign all the time. Um, so if I want to do something like a dot x, okay, now I'm going to get um, a i j. Now let's think about this for a second. So I've got three indices I can play with. There's i j here, and there's a k on the x. Okay, so sometimes Instead of writing this as just vi wi like we know for the dot product, what we'll do is write that all out and then use this symbol uh, called the Kronecker delta. Okay, this is delta j k Kronecker delta. Okay, and delta j k is equal to zero if j does not equal k. And it's equal to one if j equals k. All right. So I can use this delta here. This is yet a new, another new delta, which is kind of obnoxious. It's one reason why some people don't, most people don't use delta as a unit vector, but Bert does. So, um, 
So I can use this delta and say the only places where this one is uh, non-zero is when j is equal to k. So I can use then to get rid of this k index, and I call this a i j x j. And so now you can see that I'm doing this sum, okay, over the j index. So that looks a lot like matrix multiplication. As a matter of fact, it is matrix multiplication. So if I have a11, a12, a21, a22, and over here I have x1, x2, okay, I'm going to get the repeated index will be the second one. So I'm going to have a11, x1 plus a12, x2. Notice how I'm repeating the second one. Okay, and in the second row, I'm going to have a21, x1 plus a22, x2. Okay, so we're doing fine. Got five minutes. Okay, so that's the other key to dot products. Is dot products is the same thing as matrix multiplication. So what you want to do here is if you're multiplying by a vector on the right side, you get a column vector, okay, if you're doing matrix multiplication. If you put it on the left side, you can write a row vector and do matrix multiplication there, right? And you'll see on the left side that will be um, x i a i j if I multiply by the other side, okay? So dot products. Let's say this real quick about the properties of dot products. Okay, so uh, v dot w is equal to w dot v. So vector dot products commute like this. Um, but it really is only doing that because it's a scalar. But a dot x does not equal x dot a, as I hope you learned in matrix multiplication in your, in your algebra class, right? So it does not commute. Okay, and you can see that easily in index notation, right? Because this will be a i j x j, and this one is going to be x i a i j. Those clearly aren't the same thing. Okay. Maybe time for one more product. It's not too hard. Let's do the double dot product. Okay. The double dot product is simply if I take a tensor and another tensor, I get a scalar. All right? So whereas the dot product I had like minus two. For my dimensions, this one's like minus four, right? So I have, you know, a tensor two, tensor two, or is it minus four or minus three? Minus three, right? Two plus two, so I get a minus three, okay? So the double dot product is written as a double dot b. Yes. You called scalar a zero. Oh, it's a zero, that's right, it is minus four. It's like, it doesn't make sense, guys. Thank you. Thanks, Andrew. That's zero. Because a vector is one dimension, right? Scalar is. Come on, Chin Yu, you're supposed to keep me honest here. All right. So A dot double dot B, we'll write it out. Sum over I, sum over J. We're going to have a delta. Let's see, I'm gonna, I always get this mixed up. Let me do A I J B K L. And then I need delta JK, and I need a delta IL, and that's it. Okay, and so these are my Kronecker deltas. This is uh, my component notation. Okay, if I want to write this in my more simple index notation, I can take the JKs, 
those have to be equal, okay? Because they're only, the only one that survives when it's equal to one is when they're equal. And then the only one that's gonna equal is IL. So what I can do, do when I see that is I can just substitute whichever one I want. So I can substitute L for I, or I can substitute I for L. I like I better, so I'm gonna do AIJ, and then I have B. L gets substituted for I, so you'll have an I at the end. And then K gets substituted for J, as a J right there. So there I have AIJ times BJI. So what that's telling me is that I have a matrix A11, A12, A21, A22, and another matrix B11, B12, B21, B22, okay? And what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take the transpose of this matrix, so I'm gonna do JI, and I'm gonna do an element-wise multiplication and then sum them up, okay? Because notice I lost the sums here because I have repeated indices. Okay, so this, so I'm going to take the transpose and then do each element by the element of the transpose. So when I do the transpose, this is going to give me uh, one, two down here, and two, one up here. Okay, so that ends up giving me, I'll write it out, A11, B11 plus A12. B21 plus A21. Oh, worst two of all time. 21B12 plus A22B22. Okay? You should always be able to double check your index notation when you write it all out, right? These things should look like these guys, right? If I take an I and a J and just pick an example, say I equals one and J equals two. I should be able to find that in here when I equals one and J equals two. Okay. All right, we'll stop there. We'll stop before the calculus. I think the, all the problems on your homework were just um, practicing with products. So I think we covered all the products. I think that should be good. That's kind of a race today, huh? Zip in. Oh, there was a question? Uh -oh. oh, this one. Yeah. I answered that, right? I said the repeated index. We'll get a little more practice with with uh, index notation. I remember being kind of confused about index notation, so I don't know if I've done a good job explaining it. But,